Hi everyone, Miss Underwood here. I'm going to be reading pages 141 through 153 in The One and Only Ivan. Let's begin. Beds. One day, after many weeks of loud talking, Helen packed a bag and slammed the front door and never came back. I don't know why. I never know the why of humans. That night, I slept with Mac in his bed. My old nests were woven of leaves and sticks and shaped like his bathtub, cool green cocoons. Mac's bed, like mine, was flat, hot, without sticks or stars. Still, he made a sleeping sound like the rumble my father used to make when all was well, a sound from deep inside his belly. My place. Mac grew sullen. I grew bigger. I became what I was meant to be, too large for chairs, too strong for hugs, too big for human life. I tried to stay calm, to move with dignity. I did my best to eat daintily, but human ways are hard to learn, especially when you're not a human. When I saw my new domain, I was thrilled, and who wouldn't have been? It had no furniture to break, no glasses to smash, no toilets to drop Max keys into. It even had a tire swing. I was relieved to have my own place. Somehow, I didn't realize I'd be here quite so long. Now I drink Pepsi, eat old apples, and watch reruns on TV. But many days, I forget what I am supposed to be. Am I a human? Am I a gorilla? Humans have so many words, more than they truly need. Still, they have no name for what I am. Ruby is finally asleep. I watch her chest rise and fall. Bob, too, is snoring. But my mind is still racing for perhaps the first time ever. I've been remembering. It's an odd story to remember, I have to admit. My story has a strange shape, a stunted beginning, an endless middle. I count all the days I've lived with humans, gorillas count as well as anyone, although it's not a particularly useful skill to have in the wild. I've forgotten so many things, and yet I always know precisely how many days I've been in my domain. I take one of the magic markers Julia gave me. I make an X, a small one, on my painted jungle wall. I make more Xs and more. I make an X for every day of my life with humans. My marks look like this. The rest of the night, I mark the days, and when I am done, my wall looks like this. And so on, until there are 9,876 X's marching across my wall like a parade of ugly insects. A visit. It's almost morning when I hear steps. It's Mac. He has a sharp smell. He weaves as he walks. He stands next to my domain. His eyes are red. He is staring out the window at the empty parking lot. Ivan, my man, he mumbles. Ivan, he presses his forehead against the glass. We've been through a lot, you and me. A new beginning. We don't see Mac for two days. When he returns, he doesn't talk about Stella. Mac says he is anxious to teach Ruby some tricks. He says the billboard is bringing in more visitors. He says it's time for a new beginning. All afternoon and into the evening, Mac works with Ruby. Ruby's feet are looped with rope so that she cannot run. A heavy chain hangs off her neck. Mac shows her Stella's ball her pedestal, her stool. He introduces her to Snickers. When Ruby obeys Mac, he gives her a cube of sugar or a bit of dried apple. When she doesn't, he yells and kicks at the sawdust. When George and Julia arrive, Mac is still training Ruby. Julia sits on a bench and watches them. She draws a little, but mostly she keeps her eye on Ruby. Bob watches, too. He's hiding in the corner of my domain under not tag. It's raining outside. 
and Bob does not like damp feet. Ruby trudges behind Mac, her head drooping endlessly. They circle the ring. Sometimes Mac slaps her flank with his hand. Suddenly, Ruby jerks to a stop. Mac pulls the chain hard, but Ruby refuses to move. Come on, Ruby. Mac is almost pleading. What is your problem? She's exhausted, I say to myself. That's the problem. Mac groans. Idiot elephant. Idiot human, Bob mutters. Walk, Ruby, I say, although I know she's too far away to hear me. Do what he says. Walk, Mac commands. Now! Ruby doesn't walk. She plops her rump on the sawdust floor. I think maybe she's tired, Julia says. Mac wipes his forehead with the back of his arm. Yeah, I know. We're all tired. He pushes Ruby with the heel of his foot. She ignores him. George looks over from the food court where he is wiping off tables. Mac, he yells. Maybe you should call it a day. I close up. Mac yanks on Ruby's chain. She's in it as anchored as a trunk. He pulls harder and falls to his knees. That does it, Mac says. He brushes sod off, off his jeans. I am through playing around. Mac stomps off to his office. When he returns, he is carrying a long stick. The gleaming hook on its end is almost beautiful, like a sil like a sliver of like a sliver of moon. It's a claw stick. Mac pokes Ruby with the sharp point, not hard, just a touch. I can tell he wants to see how much it can hurt. I growl low in my throat. Ruby doesn't budge. She is a gray, unmoving boulder. She closes her eyes, and for a moment I wonder if she might have fallen asleep. I'm warning you, Mac says. He breathes out. He, he stares at the ceiling. Ruby makes a huffing sound. Fine, Mac says. You want to play it that way? He draws back the claw stick. No, Julia cries. I'm not going to hurt her, Mac says. I just want to get her attention. Bob snarls. Mac swings. The hook slices the air just a few inches above Ruby's head. See why you don't want to mess with me, Mac says. He draws back the claw stick again. Now move! Ruby jerks her head, flinging her trunk toward Mac. She makes a noise that sends the sawdust scattering. It makes my glass shiver. It is the most beautiful mad I have ever heard. Ruby's trunk slaps into Mac. I don't see exactly where she strikes him, somewhere below his stomach, I think. And I know he must be uncomfortable because Mac drops the claw stick and falls down on the ground and curls into a ball and howls like a baby. Direct hit, Bob says. All right, thank you.